a good ending can make or break a horror movie. Fortunately for Fright fans, the 21st century has been full of fantastic finales that have sent us scrambling under the covers in fear. And from ghostly apparitions to bloodthirsty vampires, here are the greatest. And here's your warning. Spoilers for all these movies, of course. The Descent has everything you'd want in a horror film. Plenty of gore, great performances, practical effects, and two endings? That's right. There are two versions of this British horror film, one released in the UK and one in the US. The film comes to a close after our last surviving character, Sarah, spots a shaft of light atop a hill of bones. Covered in blood, Sarah makes a mad scramble for the exit, leaving the cave-dwelling creatures behind. Emerging into the sunlight, Sarah hops in a car and makes her great escape, but that all comes to a screaming halt when she sees the ghost of her old friend Juno, a woman Sarah just killed for having an affair with her husband. That's where the US version ends, but in the original UK version, there are a few extra scenes that reveal Sarah never actually escaped the caverns. That whole sequence was just a dream Sarah had after tumbling down a shaft and hitting her head. In her last moments, Sarah sees her long-dead daughter sitting a few feet away, greeting her mother with a birthday cake. Of course there's no little girl, and the flames from the birthday candles are really Sarah's torch. Sarah is still trapped, and there's no escaping the crawlers as they move in for the kill. But at least she'll get to share her last few seconds with her daughter, even if it's all in her head. At first, it might seem like Let the Right One In ends on an upbeat romantic note. Two star-crossed lovers, Oscar, a 12-year-old boy, and Ely, a vampire who looks like a young girl, have just escaped a Swedish town filled with sadists and snow, bound together by murder and romance. Light-sensitive Ely is hidden away inside a box, but Oscar keeps the creature company by tapping out sweet Morse code messages, letting Ely know they'll always be together. Think about it, though. We've already seen what happens to people who pledge their lives to Ely. In the first half of the film, Ely was palling around with an adult named Hawken, who hunted down humans and drained them of their blood to keep Ely fed. But Hawken eventually botches a job so badly that he knows his arrest is imminent. He disfigures his own face so the cops can't identify him and won't trace him back to the vampire. Eventually, the vampire shows up for a late-night hospital visit, and Hawken lets the undead beast feast on his blood. That's probably what's in store for Oscar. Sooner or later, Oscar will dedicate his life to draining people dry, and sooner or later, he'll find himself haunted by his deeds and replaced by somebody younger after ending up the next meal for an undead adolescent. Bleak. In Drag Me to Hell, a bank worker named Christine is cursed after denying a loan extension. In three days, a demon called the Lamia will pull Christine into hell, and he's going to torture her every second until that devilish date. However, Christine discovers a way to escape the Lamia's clutches. If she gives the curse button away, she can avoid winding up in the underworld. Ready to get some revenge of her own, Christine digs up the now dead woman's grave who cursed her and shoves the button down her throat. Only there's one little problem. Christine has been keeping the button in an envelope. Unfortunately, her boyfriend has an identical envelope with a rare coin inside, and Christine gets the two confused. So after her late night cemetery excursion, she goes to meet her beau at a train station, and that's when he casually mentions finding the button in his car. Terrified of what's about to happen, Christine absolutely freaks out, staggering backwards in shock, tumbling off the railway platform and landing on the train tracks below. But before she can get mercifully squished by an oncoming locomotive, the ground opens up and she's dragged into hell by a mob of fiery arms. That's how you end a movie. Resolution is a deeply unsettling and underseen film about two friends who are trapped in a real-life horror movie. When graphic designer Michael receives a mysterious video from his junkie friend Chris, Michael decides it's intervention time. Michael drives out to Chris's country cabin, handcuffs him to a pipe, and forces his buddy to go cold turkey. However, the intervention veers into spooky territory when Michael starts discovering photos, records, and slides all around the cabin. They all depict incredibly creepy stories that usually end in death. And things get way scarier when Michael and Chris start finding videos of themselves. 
videos that show them getting killed by drug addicts. The two eventually realize they're the victims of an evil entity that sees them as characters in a horror story. The duo try their best to outsmart the beast, and they certainly seem to. The druggies who've been threatening them throughout the film are killed, the haunted cabin is set ablaze, and Chris decides to go to rehab. It's the perfect happy ending, one they hope will set them free. As the cabin burns to the ground, the entity rears its monstrous head and confronts the two characters. Desperate for another chance, Michael begs. Can we try it another way? <laughs> and that's the end. Creepy. The Babadook belongs to a very unique subgenre of scary films, movies about parents who can't stand their kids. The Babadook actually ends on an upbeat note, unlike many others in this genre. The terrorized mom overcomes her demons and starts a new life for herself and her son. Amelia was widowed the same day she gave birth to her son, Samuel. Now, whenever she sees her kid, she can only think about her dead husband. Needless to say, Amelia isn't handling her grief well. She's let it fester and grow for so long that there's now a fanged creature with a fondness for pop-up books hanging around her house. The Babadook even possesses Amelia, forcing her to try and murder Samuel. But after driving the demon out, Amelia comes to terms with her grief and sends the Babadook scurrying down to the basement. In the film's final minutes, we see a transformed Amelia in her garden. Her anger towards Samuel has disappeared. Together, the two search their yard for worms, and after filling a bowl with the creatures, Amelia takes the dish down to the basement, where she offers the worms to the Babadook. Even though she's exercised the beast, he's still lurking down there, and just like Amelia's grief, he'll never go away completely. It's a chilling metaphor for grief and anger, and a great closing note. Horror movies often have twisted endings, but the ending to The Black Coat's Daughter is just downright sad. This atmospheric film follows two teenage girls left behind at a boarding school. The semester is over, but these two are stuck, their parents nowhere in sight. That's perfectly fine with Rose, a senior with a secret she needs to deal with. But poor Kat isn't handling the abandonment well. Thanks to a creepy dream about her parents' fate, she fears she'll be left alone forever. So naturally, Kat makes a deal with the devil. The demon makes her commit horrible deeds, but Kat legitimately feels at peace. After she's caught by the cops, an exorcist kicks the demon out of Kat. And even though she begs the spirit to stay, Old Scratch drifts away, leaving Kat all alone again. Years later, Kat has escaped from a mental hospital and plans on returning to her school, hoping to find her demonic buddy. Along the way, she's picked up a middle-aged couple who happen to be the parents of Rose, the senior that Kat decapitated back in the day. Things don't end well for the destroyed parents, but when Kat shows up at the school with two fresh heads in tow, the demon is nowhere to be found. That's when it hits Kat that she'll be alone forever, and the film ends with her crying in the snow, abandoned by everyone. Crimson Peak tells the devastating story of Edith Cushing, an American heiress who marries charming English aristocrat Thomas Sharp. Sharp is an inventor who lives in a mansion ravaged by time, a dying house sinking into the blood-red earth. And when Edith arrives at Sharp's crumbling estate, she learns she won't exactly be the lady of the house, as Thomas lives with his cold, calculating sister Lucille. Actually, Thomas and Lucille are doing way more than just living together. In addition to having a physical relationship, the penniless siblings have been keeping afloat by getting Thomas hitched to wealthy women and then killing off the unlucky brides. Edith discovers she's next on the Sharps list, but a love-struck Thomas agrees to help Edith escape. Lucille offs her brother and confronts Edith, morphing into a ghostly slasher and fluttering through the fog as Edith holds her off with a knife. Her ghostly brother distracts her just long enough for Edith to finish her off. Edith then leaves Crimson Peak forever, but as our hero narrates over the final scene, we see the dark spirit of Lucille sitting at her piano, playing a mournful lullaby for time eternal. Simple, but extremely effective. The Alien series has never been a feel-good franchise, but when it comes to downbeat endings, Alien Covenant goes darker than any previous entry. The film focuses on a ship full of humans traveling the stars and hoping to wake up in a new world full of new possibilities. These sleeping souls have no idea the crew has made an ill-fated detour to a nearby planet, one that's home to killer aliens 
and a psychopathic android named David. We first met David in Prometheus, and his disdain for humans has only grown since the first film. He views people simply as subjects for his experiments, and he'd like to run a few tests on Covenant Officer Daniels. She escapes David's grasp with the help of Walter, an android who's the same model as David, only way better when it comes to his people skills. After Walter defeats David off-screen, he returns to the Covenant with Daniels and puts her into cryosleep for their long journey ahead. But moments before going under, Walter's kindly smile morphs into a sadistic smirk, and Daniels realizes this isn't her robo-buddy after all. It's actually David, but there's nothing she can do as he puts her under. With Daniels out of the way, David coughs up two alien embryos and strolls through the massive cryo chamber, admiring the pods full of sleeping colonists. Don't let the bed bugs bite. I'll tuck in the children. M. Night Shyamalan movies are always judged on the strength of their endings. He's occasionally struggled with sticking the landing since The Sixth Sense, but Shyamalan recaptured some of that glory with Split. This 2017 hit follows a disturbed dude named Kevin, a man with 24 personalities bouncing around his brain. Some are friendly, some are dangerous, but the dreaded beast is a straight-up monster, a cannibalistic creature who can scale walls, bend metal, and deflect gunshots. In the final three minutes of the film, after the climactic showdown with Casey Cook, we watch as Kevin examines himself in a mirror, awestruck that he's just survived a shotgun blast to the chest. And that's where the movie proper ends, with Kevin's evil personalities basking in their new abilities and plotting their war on the impure. Let him share the world how powerful we can be. That right there would be a killer ending, but it's made even better by an extra scene at a diner. The horrified patrons are watching a news report about the beast. One customer is reminded of Mr. Glass, the mad genius from Shyamalan's 2002 film Unbreakable. And that's when we see David Dunn sipping coffee at the end of the bar and realizing it's time to grab his green raincoat. In just one minute, the entire fabric of the film has been changed. Split wasn't just a freaky horror movie, it was a stealth sequel to Unbreakable all along. Mother is one part biblical allegory, one part environmental metaphor, and totally disturbing from beginning to end. Jennifer Lawrence stars as the titular mother, wife of a beloved poet known simply as him. However, their little world is threatened by the arrival of an entire host of odd people intent on destroying their home. Once you realize that Mother represents Mother Earth and him is God, things start clicking into place. The film rehashes several well-known biblical tales. When Mother's newborn baby is murdered by the masses, that's symbolic of Christ's crucifixion. All the people him has welcomed into his home begin destroying everything in sight, desecrating the planet Earth, if you will. And Mother can only take so much abuse for so long. After the death of her baby, Mother snaps and fights back by setting the house on fire. The house is burned to ash. The people are purged away by flames, but since him is an immortal being, he survives without a single burn. The all-powerful poet picks up Mother's charred body and removes a crystal from her chest, taking the last of her love so he can rebuild his home, create a new wife, and start over again. And that's how this horror show ends, with the cycle beginning anew, all because him craves praise and affection for his literary creations. Baby? A Quiet Place was a critical and commercial smash when it hit theaters in 2018. And one of the reasons the film was so successful is the fact that it features one of the most memorable endings in horror movie history. A Quiet Place focuses on the Abbott family who are trying to survive in a world plagued by monsters. These extraterrestrial creatures are blind, but their sense of hearing is incredibly acute. Knock over a lantern, trip on the stairs, or shout in pain, and they'll slice you in half. <laughs> On top of that, they're covered in natural armor, making them nearly impossible to kill. As a result, the Abbots must adapt to live in a world without sound, keeping as quiet as possible at all times. Because the creature's ears are so sensitive, they can't stand the feedback from Reagan's cochlear implants. So when she and the surviving family members are trapped in a basement by one of the beasts, Reagan uses her hearing aid to drive one of the monsters crazy. It starts to writhe in pain, allowing Reagan's mother to kill the weakened creature with a shotgun blast. 
Of course, the gunshot attracts the other nearby aliens, but the Abbots aren't afraid. They've got the upper hand, and as the evil ETs make a beeline for the basement, Regan gets her new weapon ready, and her mom racks another shell into her shotgun, ready to make some noise. For all its sci-fi trappings, Annihilation is very much a horror movie. It's got hideous mutants, extreme body horror, and uber-creepy plant people. But perhaps the most terrifying scene comes when Natalie Portman encounters a mysterious being that mirrors her every move. Annihilation finds Portman playing Lena, a soldier-turned-scientist who's haunted by guilt and regret. Her military husband, Kane, has disappeared after venturing into the Shimmer. Lena blames herself for Kane's disappearance, as her bad choices might have driven her husband to a suicide mission. But a year after vanishing, Kane reappears, confused, missing memories, and incredibly sick. I don't know where it was or what it was. How is that possible? Wanting to know what happened to Kane, Lena joins a scientific team heading into the Shimmer, which refracts and combines everything from memories to DNA. She eventually winds up at a lighthouse where she meets a metallic humanoid that copies her movements and steals her likeness. A horrified Lena tries to escape, but the humanoid won't let her leave. It even pins her against the door, suffocating Lena with the weight of its body. She escapes, but this is where things get ambiguous. Did the real Lena escape, or is this her double? When she hugs her husband, both their eyes dance and change colors, just like the Shimmer. So is this the real Lena? Ultimately, it really doesn't matter. The only thing that does is that Lena has changed. The woman who walked into the Shimmer has come out a completely different person. Confusing, but fascinating. Upgrade is set in a near future where most humans are totally cool with having technological implants. One exception is Grey Trace, but after a gang of thugs kill his wife and leave him paralyzed, Grey finds himself totally reliant on technology. Thanks to an oddly benevolent billionaire, Gray has been implanted with an AI named Stem. Stem connects Gray's brain to his body, allowing him to move around for the first time in months. He's also oddly keen on helping Gray find his wife's killers. Together, the two stalk the streets, dishing out grisly deaths to the crooks who ruin Gray's life. However, at the end of the film, Gray discovers Stem has been pulling the strings all along. The AI desperately wanted to be human and thought Grey was the perfect host, so he turned the mechanic into a widowed quadriplegic, and once he got inside Grey's brain, he murdered anyone who knew of his existence, from the killers to his creator. Holding tight to his last shreds of humanity, Grey fights back, desperately trying to save an innocent detective. In that struggle, Grey's mind finally breaks, his brain goes limp, and Stem locks him away in a dream world a paradise where his wife is still alive. In some ways, it's a happy ending for Grey, but also horrifying when you realize that Stem has achieved his final goal. Grey's not here anymore. He's in a better place, in his mind, where he wants to be. Hereditary is a tough watch of a film with an incredibly deranged ending. Basically, the movie follows a doomed family that's being manipulated into bringing a demon named Payman into the world. He's been possessing a little girl named Charlie for a few years, but Payman would prefer to possess a male, so his followers plot to transfer the spirit into Charlie's older brother, Peter. Of course, that involves a rather complicated ritual where you have to decapitate Charlie, host a disturbing seance, and set a man on fire. In the last few minutes of Hereditary, Peter is chased around the house by his possessed mom. Everywhere he runs, he keeps bumping into naked, aging cult members. And to cap everything off, Peter watches in horror as his mom saws her own head off with a wire. He's having a rough night. It's all too much for Peter, who throws himself out a window and ends up getting controlled by Payman anyway. In the film's final scene, a possessed Peter is surrounded by worshipful cult members, the beheaded corpse of his mom and grandmother, and a freaky shrine that prominently features Charlie's decapitated head. Wholesome family fun. All I do is worry and slave and defend you, and all I get back is that face on your face. Mandy is a blood-soaked, acid trip of a movie that blends a whole host of genres. But in its heavy metal heart, Mandy is a horror film. The film boasts Nicolas Cage as Red Miller, who wants revenge for his murdered wife, Mandy. Since we're talking about Nick Cage, that means doing battle with demons and getting into chainsaw fights with psycho hippies. 
From the moment his wife is immolated, Red begins to lose his mind. It doesn't help any when he samples some of the world's trippiest LSD, which plunges him deep into the cosmic darkness. His eyes become fireballs of rage, and in the film's final minutes, he hunts down the members of the hippie cult that killed his wife and puts his freshly forged axe to good use. When he finally confronts the insecure cult leader, Jeremiah Sand, he crushes the man's skull with his hands before setting Sand's church on fire. As the building burns down, for a moment, everything is peaceful. The blood is gone from his face and he sees the spirit of Mandy riding shotgun. He flashes back to the moment they first met at a club, wearing identical t-shirts, but then reality comes crashing back hard. Red is still soaked with gore and grinning like a madman, and as he drives off to nowhere, we see two eerie planets hanging over the horizon. Is this another world? Is it all in his head? It's a truly freaky moment, and one that's bound to stir up debate among horror fans for years to come. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.